very hard to take off. How much fuel would it carry? It carried um, 80,000 pounds of JP7, which was a special fuel with a very high thermal point, price point. And um, if my math is anywhere near correct, that's about like 12 and a half thousand gallons. Uh -huh. Something like that. Yeah. Six pounds, six point something. Yeah, pounds. yeah, something like that. The mission I flew that needed five refuelings was um, it was out of Beale Air Force Base in Northern California. We refueled over over Idaho, then we accelerated across the United States, descended, refueled off the East Coast of the United States, then we accelerated, flew across the Atlantic Ocean through the GI UK gap, refueled off the coast of Norway, and then we went up into the Barents Sea, where the Soviets have their uh, missile submarines, their nuclear submarines. We flew couple of passes by Murmansk, where they, where they are. Then we came back to Bodo, refueled, back through the GI UK gap across the Atlantic, refueled off the coast of the United States, and all the way across the United States, back to the Wow. Took, took just under 11 hours. 11 hours for all that. Yeah. <laughs> so how long would it take to go around, at 80,000, 85,000 feet, how long would it take to go around the globe? You know, I don't know, but my navigator and I were we were picked, we were the selected crew of the fly and around the world mission if we were going to do one, but they decided that it would cost too much money, it would look bad, it wouldn't be a good thing to do, so they never did it. Um, and I don't remember how long it was going to take, um, it was going to take a while. Because I mean, you're up so high. Yeah, the, the mission we flew that was 11 hours was, um, was uh, like 17, 18,000 miles. You went on that mission. Yeah, five something like that. Around the world is what about 24,000 miles to flew the equator. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't know. You, you wouldn't up, be able to do that. High, you yeah. wouldn't be able to do that because of the noise of bait and stuff like that. So. Yeah. So. I'm sorry. You know, you don't feel anything. A lot of people ask me that. They say, Joe, what's it feel like? Well, any pilots in the group? Are, no. You tell, uh, okay. Have a General aviation. Then, then, then you know, airplanes smell a little different, right? And they all sound a little different. In the SR-71, um, you're in that pressure suit, so you're, you're breathing 100% oxygen in your nasal cavity, and then you can't hear it because you're blowing air through your pressure suit to keep your body kind of cool. So you're in the airplane, you can't hear it, you can't see, you can't see, you, you can't hear it, you can't smell it, and then you're sitting so far forward as a pilot, you can't really even see it because I can't turn my head far enough to see the airplane. So you can't hear it, you can't see it, you can't smell it. Um, and this giant area right here, where that point is, when you're sitting in the cockpit, if you're in level flight, and you look out on the sides, um, the closest I can see the airplane is about 50 miles out, because I'm looking over that chine, so you don't have a great sensation of speed either. Nor do you have any, you don't have any of this like you're being thrown back in the seat of If that's what you're getting at, you have none of that. So. Not like those, not like those movies you see. No, you have nothing. Vibrating. <laughs> no, and the... It's a one G airpline, uh, which means you're standing at one G here, one gravity. So it's a one G airplane. Now, when you take off on the runway, you get that kick in your butt. You get that boom boom, uh, and you take off and you go refuel and all. Uh, but we didn't do loops in this airplane. We didn't pull a lot of G's like you would in a fighter airplane. We just went off and flew. Um, you could pull a G and a half probably, which is hardly anything. Um, so there was no sensation of that. And when you went through the speed of sound the first time, Mach 1, um, if you looked at your gauges, your, um, your gauges that operate, whoops, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, your gauges that operate off of this pedostatic boom right here, it's getting it, they would, they would lag a little bit. They would, they would, you'd see them kind of slow up, and then they would catch up with you. You could get a feeling that the airplane was lagging, but the airplane wasn't just a gauges. And then when you went through Mach 2 and Mach 3, you just went right through. Not like the movies you see where you're shaking the light. Yeah, no no, no shaking. Off, put, from that high, would it put off a sonic boom? Put off two sonic booms. All airplanes put off a, a sonic boom off the nose when they go supersonic. It's that, that cone that goes out, forms that supersonic shock wave. It comes around. The SR-71, though, see that spike? It's got a spike on both sides uh -huh. of the engine. Those spikes would also produce a sonic boom. So the SR-71 had a very distinctive double sonic boom. Boom, boom. So it was very obvious when you flew overhead. Which brings me to a funny story. Uh, one, of the, one, of the, um, one of the missions we would fly would be over Cuba. And um, 
we would fly there when we'd sneak out of Beale Air Force Base, fly across the United States, radio silent, get into the Gulf of Mexico, refuel, when we knew that Castro was reviewing his troops. You know, we were standing there in Atlanta uh -huh. reviewing the troops. We'd, we'd climb up over the Gulf of Mexico, accelerate right down the heart of Cuba, so we'd hear that very distinctive double sonic boom, so that he knew that we were also you reviewing were, his yeah, troops. We were reviewing his yeah, troops. We were reviewing his troops You're also. not alone. That's huh? right, you're not <laughs> alone. <laughs> Sure. You've got a face mask in front of you. Not really. Not in the SR. You didn't have a face mask. You had a helmet on. Okay, so. So you had a helmet on. Your head is covered all the time. You're totally covered, yeah. What do you so do you can't go. Nose itches. <laughs> well, you know, that's a good question. What do you do with your nose itches? Uh, we carried two food and water, and, and right in the middle of our face plate, there was a port, like a feeding port. And, and the water we carried, or Gatorade, and the food, the tubes, it's like baby food. You um, had, a, had a tube, had a, uh, what do you call it? Straw. Straw, thank you, like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was rubberized. Yeah. You just, you kind of stuck it through that port, got to your nose. If you had an itchy nose, you just got it. <laughs> but you, you put, you'd stick it through there and then you could squeeze and eat and you could drink and... Um, you said Gatorade, I thought it was Tang. <laughs> I drank it, you know, I, I will tell you, I went for years without, because um, I always thought you were a wuss if you took something to eat or drink. But then I did it one time, I took some applesauce, and water, but I took applesauce, and when I took the applesauce, um, whether it was the sugar content or anything, but my vision got a whole lot better. All of a sudden, I could wow. see again. I, yeah, I mean, I guess I guess breathing 100% oxygen, being up there in that, that atmosphere for four or five hours, you don't notice it, but you know, you're not seeing as well as you should see. Oh, I took that, I took that applesauce, and wow! Yeah. Then I was scared again, I thought, holy cow! How long did you train before you fly? How long did I train? Um, well, to get into the program, as a pilot, you had to have flown, when I did it, you had to have flown three different airplanes. You had to have 1,500 hours, about, more than that. You had to have flown, as a pilot, they wanted a fast mover, guys that flew fast airplanes, jets and those types of things. And you had to have had air refueling experience where you air refueled. As, that's to get in. Because um, they didn't have time to teach you how to do all those things. So once I was accepted for the program, um, I went to Beale Air Force Base, and they married me up with my navigator. And he and I went through training together, and it took us about 10 months. I went through, I got dual qualified in a different airplane, because the pilots were all dual qualified, because this airplane was expensive to fly, so we only flew training missions that we had to fly in that, and we flew a smaller jet, because it was cheaper to fly, just, just, just so we could fly. Because um, we didn't fly this one that much. We train in it about three times a month because of the cost, and then we go, We'd deploy, and then we'd fly more when we were deployed, obviously, in operations. No stories. simulators? Oh, we had a simulator. Had a simulator. Part simulator. of the training was had 100 hours of simulator, then they had to have 100 hours in the airplane. After all that, which took about 10 months, we were considered operationally ready to go fly a mission. And then after that, it was interesting, because of the re regime we flew in and the speed and the, the, the need for crew coordination, once, once we recruited and we did that, all the training, if one of us got sick for an operational mission, by definition, we were both sick. I had to, they had to put a whole new crew in the airplane. So I could fly a training mission with another navigator, and he could with another pilot. But on an operational story, I had to fly with him. That's why you called being married to him. Yeah, that's what my wife said, too. Yeah. How many teams did you have that would fly? Um, generally speaking, we had um, 12 to 14 checked out crews, and one crew in training, and one crew who just accepted and just got the deal. Over the course of the program, which was from uh, the first airplane was delivered to the Air Force in 1966, first operational mission was over North Vietnam in 68, uh, the last missions were in the end of 89. Over the course of the program, there were 86 pilots that were operationally pilots. 86. There were more pilots than that, but there were 86 Six. that were qualified to fly up. How, how many planes uh, that were built? There were 32, 32. airplanes that were built, but and 12 were lost. Now, the CIA had an airplane just before this, the A-12 airplane that flew. Um, they made 15 of them. The SR-71 is one of what they call the Blackbird family of aircraft. There's 50 of them. That includes the CIA's A-12s, which flew operationally out of Okinawa, Japan from 67 to 68. I understand they flew 29 operational missions, three over North Vietnam, two over Laos, Cambodia, and whatever the rest is. Were you able to parachute out of here? You said they were lost. We, 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 we yeah, now all the ones, are, most of the ones that were lost were lost at low altitude. None were shot down. They just were lost because airplanes get lost once in a while. Mm -hmm. um, your question, yes. 
there were ejections over 80,000 feet and over Mach 3, and everybody survived. Really? I understand yeah. it's a real wild ride down. Oh, I would bet. Yeah, real wild ride. The whole bomb guarder didn't have anything on you. Yeah, no, you just come yeah, yeah, yeah. way. Yeah. I talked to one of the guys who actually didn't eject. He was actually at altitude, and the airplane came apart on him. Came apart, and he just was then floating through the air in his, in his uh, seat. So you free fall to um, 15,000 feet, about, in the mm -hmm. seat. And it's got a little stabilizing drill. Mm -hmm. You free fall, and then um, there's explosive bolts on your seat belt that kind of pop out. Then they have what we call a butt snapper. They kind of and it snaps you in the butt and throws you out of the seat. Puts you right out of there. And then, and then uh, from there, from 15,000 feet, you fall to about 10,000 feet. Then you've got an aneroid barometer in your parachute that opens up automatically. It's on the front. Huh? So you got a mission plan well enough to know you're not flying. Like if you're flying over the Ural Mountains, this is not good because they're a lot higher than 10,000 feet. Uh -huh. So you want to know where you're flying. Wow. So you know you want to pull your pressure. You know, if you're going to eject, you got to pull your. Is all this automatic on the picture taking and the surveillance, the, the accumulation of data, or did someone have to actually it was, put their finger on a button? It was my, both. They could pre-program the sensors to, to point at different cam, uh, targets and take pictures automatically. Or, in some cases, my navigator would have to point the cameras at different sensors. Or if it was pre-programmed, he would monitor, and he would say to me, um, Joe, um, uh, right technical camera is coming on in 30 seconds, pointing uh, 25 degrees out, 45 degrees left, at a radar site. Being a good pilot and crew member, even though I didn't really care, I would say, thanks. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I'm, I'm busy up here. Well, thanks. Yeah. Good, to, good to hear. I gotta, you know, and then he'd say, camera on. I'd acknowledge that. And then he'd say, camera off. And I'd acknowledge that. But uh, he, would, he, would, he would always monitor it and sometimes control it. Where is that going for? Where is that going for? That's a good joke. The most dangerous part of flying any airplane is flying with another pilot. And then the last two words you'll ever hear is, watch this. <laughs> watch this.